Hi, welcome everyone to the LEAD Center webinar on competitive integrated employment as a civil right for people with disabilities. I'm Rebecca Salon, project director of the LEAD Center. Before we start the webinar, we wanted to go over a few logistics so that you'll be able to fully participate in the webinar. The audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. You can control the audio broadcast via the audio broadcast panel. If you accidentally close the panel, you can reopen it by choosing the communicate menu at the top of the screen and choosing join audio broadcast. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or prefer to listen by phone, please dial one of the numbers on the screen, 1-415-655-0001. Or toll free at 1-855-749-4750. The meeting code is 664-803-006. You do not need to enter an attendee ID. Captioning is available. Real-time captioning is provided during the webinar. The captions can be found in the media viewer panel which appears in the lower right corner of the webinar platform. If you want to make the media viewer panel larger, you can minimize other panels like chat, Q&A, and or participants. For Q&A, please use the Q&A box to submit any questions you have during the webinar, and we will direct the questions accordingly during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you are listening by phone and not logged into the webinar, you may also ask questions by emailing questions to B Taylor, that's B T A Y L O R, at NDI hyphen INC dot O R G. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on the Leap Center website at the link provided. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box to send any messages to the host, Nakia Matthews or you may email her at nmatthews, it's n-m-a-t-t-h-e-w-s at ndi-inc.org. For those of you who are new to the LEAD Center, we are the National Center on Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities. LEAD Center is a collaborative of disability workforce and economic empowerment organizations led by National Disability Institute was funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. Our mission is to advance sustainable individual and systems level change that results in improved competitive integrated employment and economic self-sufficiency outcomes for individuals across the spectrum of disability. The agenda for today's meeting is to discuss the importance of employment as a civil right for people with disabilities. Presenters will explain their views on the linkage between employment first and civil rights legislation, the law and policy focused on the inclusion of people with disabilities in their communities. There'll be a discussion on how supporting transformation to competitive integrated employment aligns with changing laws and policies to improve the lives of people with disabilities and their families, and there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. We're very excited about today's webinar, and with that, I would like to turn this over to today's moderators for Michael Morris, Executive Director of National Disability Institute and LEAD Center's Public Policy Co-Chair, and Gary Shaheen, Director for Policy and Programs at Social Dynamics, LLC. Michael? Thank you, Rebecca, and, and thank you all for joining us across the country. Very excited to have so many of you today, Election Day. Uh, everywhere, and uh, uh, also uh, very pleased to be able to share with you uh, an outstanding panel of speakers. Uh, the panelists you will hear from includes Regina Klein, Senior Counsel, Office of Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division, United States Department of Justice. Uh, we also will be joined by Annette Shea, Program Specialist, Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And our third panel member is Allison Wall, Executive Director of the Association of People Supporting Employment First, or better known to many of you as APSI. 
Before I turn to Christopher Button, who is the supervisor of the Workforce Systems Policy, Office of Disability Employment Policy, and U.S. Department of Labor, I want to first turn to my co-chair of this, uh, my co-moderator of this uh, important webinar, Gary Shaheen, with some thoughts and observations on this election day. Gary? Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, and hi, everybody. Um, this is an important webinar, and actually, President Franklin D. Roosevelt State of the Union Address, given to Congress on January 6, 1941, at that time proclaimed that there are four fundamental freedoms that people everywhere in the world should enjoy, the first being freedom of speech, and there is freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Yet 75 years have passed since FDR's address was given, and today people with disabilities across the United States and throughout the world still experience poverty in record numbers, estimated at over 30%, and are predominantly unemployed, with the current unemployment estimates between 60 to 80%. So I agree with Michael, it's appropriate that today on this election day, where we celebrate our freedom to elect our leaders, that ODEP and LEAD and Social Dynamics offers this webinar on competitive integrated employment as a civil right for people with disabilities. And before I turn it back to Michael, then you might be interested in reading a just released issues brief on provider transformation that Social Dynamics produced for ODEP and the LEAD Center that will be posted very shortly to the LEAD Center website and made available through the listserv. Uh, that document provides principles and practices that are being used throughout the country in ODEP's Employment First initiative to assist people with disabilities in transitioning from sheltered, segregated work environments to competitive, integrated employment, and in one way, fulfilling FDRs challenge to us all. So with that, Michael, back to you and to Chris. Thank you, Gary, and let me turn it over to Chris Button. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Gary. Thank you to all of the uh, presenters that we're going to be hearing about, and thank you to everyone who's dialed in today to um, be a part of this really exciting webinar. It is an exciting time for public policy as it uh, impacts youth and adults, particularly those with the most significant impact of disability in their life. A former colleague of mine once said to me that in many ways, public policy is a statement of values. It is a statement of what we value as a nation in terms of programs and services and in terms of disability. How do we value people with disabilities as workers? as employees, as colleagues, how we value their contribution. It has been a very long and winding road getting to where we are right now in the world of public policy and competitive integrative employment, but it's a very exciting time. There is lots of policy, lots of research, lots of reports, such as the one recently released by the Advisory Committee on Increasing Competitive Integrative Employment for Individuals with Disabilities that is clearly putting us in the direction, front and center, integrated competitive employment is where we need to be in terms of public policy. So um, I think that uh, what our speakers are going to be talking about today, the policy that the, the agencies or the, the system that they are representing, um, the recent releases, is just all very exciting. I'm really honored to have all of the leaders on the call today, both our speakers and our two moderators, as well as, again, you people who are dialing in, because if you weren't dialing in, you know, the fact that you've dialed in means that you are interested and want to learn more, want to hear more about this, um, this exciting public policy movement. So, Michael, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and I'm just really um, appreciative of uh, our speakers today and looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's turn to our panel. Uh, first, you will hear from Regina Klein, Senior Counsel with the uh, Civil Rights Division at the United States Department of Justice. Regina, take it away.
today about the Justice Department's work on our enforcement of the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision. The Olmstead decision and our work in that area as applied to employment service systems is really the subject of today's conversation. I'm so happy to see that we are joined by so many participants. I'm, I'm a senior counsel, as it was mentioned, in the Office of Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division at DOJ. And at the DOJ, we work clearly across the Civil Rights Division and with other federal agencies on a range of Americans with Disabilities Act enforcement issues as it relates to community integration for individuals with disabilities. And clearly, as Chris stated, this is a very exciting moment. It's a critical inflection point for integrated employment nationwide. And the Department of Justice has in recent years been engaged in efforts to vigorously enforce the Supreme Court's decision in Olmstead, a ruling that requires states to eliminate unnecessary segregation of persons with disabilities and to move such persons who can and want to receive services in the community out of segregated settings. Olmstead enforcement has been a top priority for this administration and for the Department of Justice in particular. Um, the Department's Olmstead enforcement work since 2009 has directly impacted 50, 53,000 individuals. Up until 2011, Olmstead litigation involved primarily the unnecessary segregation of people with disabilities in residential institutions. But recent enforcement actions brought by DOJ have challenged states' over-reliance on segregated employment settings. And over the past few years, such enforcement actions have been accompanied by broad policy changes to promote and expand the array of integrated employment service options available to individuals with disabilities across the country. So, Title II of the ADA is the area of law that the Justice Department has enforced um, in, in this area. It, it, um, it involves something called the Integration Mandate Regulation, which requires public entities to administer services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of qualified individuals with disabilities. And the definition of the most integrated setting is one that enables individuals with disabilities to interact with non-disabled persons to the fullest extent possible. Folks often ask what Olmstead is about. And in 1999, the Supreme Court was presented with the opportunity to apply the, this integration mandate in a case brought by two women with developmental disabilities who were challenging their unnecessary segregation in a residential institution that was owned and operated by the state of Georgia. And the Supreme Court held that Title II of the ADA prohibits the unjustified segregation of individuals with disabilities. And the language that the court used to support its holding is powerful to say the least. The court stated that this holding reflects two very evident judgments. Um, first, that institutional placement of persons who can handle and benefit from community settings perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that persons so isolated are incapable or unworthy of participating in community life. And second, that confinement in, in institutions severely diminishes the everyday life activities of individuals, including, as the Supreme Court mentioned, work options. On the slide is the court's specific analytical framework in setting out Olmstead. And under Olmstead, public entities are required to provide community-based services to persons with disabilities when such services are appropriate and the affected persons do not oppose community-based treatment and where community-based services can be reasonably accommodated, taking into account the resources available to the entity and the needs of others who are receiving disability services from that entity. So the ADA's integration mandate um, is implicated in a number of situations. Although Olmstead was decided in the context of a state-run facility, the integration mandate applies generally wherever government programs result in unjustified segregation, not only by operating facilities or programs that segregate people with disabilities, but by financing the segregation of people with disabilities in private placements or by promoting segregation through 
planning and service system design, funding choices and, and practices. It's important to recognize that the ADA and Olmstead are not limited to individuals already in institutions or other segregated settings. It also extends to people at serious risk of institutionalization. And examples include, it may include people with urgent needs on wait lists for services or people subject to cuts in community services leading to their unnecessary institutionalization. And the ADA and the integration mandate truly have a broad reach. Title II of the ADA covers all services, programs, and activities of all state and local government entities. So there isn't any question that employment and day services provided by the state are covered by this integration mandate. So I want to tell you about a district court decision in Oregon in May of 2012 that, um, that set a frame around this area of law. In 2012, the district court in Lane v. Kitzhaber, which was a case that was later renamed Lane v. Brown, the court found there that the ADA and Olmstead applies to government services, programs, and activities that include employment services. And there the court rejected the argument that the ADA and Olmstead only apply to residential service programs. In finding plaintiff's claims valid under two, Title II of the ADA, the court stated that the broad language and remedial purposes of the ADA support the conclusion that the integration mandate applied to employment services. And that's a new and important precedent supporting the Department of Justice Olmstead enforcement work. And it's consistent with other settlements that preceded the court ruling in which we've included as an important um, aspect of settlement, supported employment services. And there there's a list of other consent decrees and settlement agreements in which the department prior to the 2012 ruling had included supported employment as important relief. So the department has advanced the civil rights of thousands of individuals with disabilities who have been unnecessarily segregated in sheltered workshops or placed at serious risk of such unnecessary segregation. And we've done so specifically in three cases across three years. United States versus Rhode Island and the city of Providence, which was in 2013, the United States versus Rhode Island, which was in 2014, and the United States versus Oregon or Lane v. Brown, as we mentioned earlier in 2015, the case was resolved. And each of these cases were brought under Title II of the ADA and Olmstead. And through court enforceable settlement agreements, these cases together will ensure that approximately 10,500 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities will receive the services and supports necessary to work in competitive integrated employment and to participate in a range of integrated recreational and day activities during the hours when they are not working. So just want to be clear here, what does integrated employment mean? And the Department of Justice has taken the position in the settlements that we just referred to and in subsequent guidance that integrated employment must include individualized typical jobs in the community with wages at least minimum wage or above where people are working among peers without, dis without disabilities with the ability to interact with peers without disabilities to the fullest extent possible and for the maximum number of hours that are consistent with the person's abilities and preferences. And there we have a definition of integrated day services as it might appear in our work in uh, consent various consent decrees that were just referred to, which includes integrated ways to spend the day when individuals are not working, including recreational, social, educational, cultural, and athletic activities, including community volunteer activities and training activities. I want to be respectful of my colleagues who are speaking after me, and so I, I've included more slides than we could possibly go through, but to give a flavor of the three cases that were mentioned. The first case involving USB Rhode Island in the city of Providence. There the Department of Justice, the state of Rhode Island, and the city of Providence entered into an agreement in June 2013 that involved one of Rhode Island's largest sheltered workshops 
and a high school-based in-school sheltered workshop, which the Department of Justice found fed graduating students into the adult workshop as a virtual pipeline. And let's just talk about some of the facts briefly from that case. Individuals at the adult sheltered workshop spent the day packaging and labeling medical supplies and wrapping television remote controls in addition to other things. And they earned an average of $1.57 an hour, with one individual earning as little as $0.14 cents an hour. They typically remained in this adult workshop for 15 to 30 years. And as of January of 2013, only one or two individuals were known by the provider to have transitioned from that adult workshop into an integrated setting or into competitive integrated employment from the workshop. As far as the in-school shelter workshop in this case, it had served as a direct pipeline, as mentioned, to the adult shelter workshop, channeling students from a student-based shelter in-school program uh, where, where students performed rote manual tasks in exchange for subminimum wages. And in 2013, it was clear that over the past 26 years, only a handful of people with disabilities had ever transitioned into competitive integrated employment after leaving the school program. And in the school, students earned between 50 cents and $2 an hour. This describes the, um, the court-ordered settlement agreement in that case in which the school to shelter workshop pipeline was dismantled and in which adults and youth were assured person-centered career development, development planning, youth transition services and supports, and most importantly, placements that the state and city need to meet in order to place individuals in the uh, impacted population in competitive integrated employment um, over the coming years. In 2014, the United States expanded its investigation across the state of Rhode Island. Um, and specifically, we found that approximately 80% of the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities receiving state services in Rhode Island were placed in segregated sheltered workshop programs. By contrast, only about 12% participated in any kind of individualized integrated employment. So that investigation primarily found that the state had over-relied on segregated service settings to the exclusion of integrated alternatives. And I just want to quickly state that we also found that placement in the shelter workshops across the state of Rhode Island frequently led to permanent placement. Nearly half of the individuals in the workshops in Rhode Island had been in the setting for 10 years or more, and over a third had been there for 15 years or more. And individuals across Rhode Island at the time of the investigation earned only an average of $2.21 an hour. We also found that youth across Rhode Island were placed at serious risk of institutionalization unnecessarily in sheltered workshops. Um, and this is the data point over a two-year period, only about 5% transitioned into jobs in competitive settings. So in April of that year, 2014, the Justice Department entered into a consent decree that provided relief to 3,250 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And again, this relief provided for employment in typical jobs in the community at competitive wages and integrated ways to spend your day when you're not in your job. So skipping over to very quickly, just to make mention of the, the consent decree with the state of Oregon, we also found in an independent investigation in Oregon that, um, that Oregon similarly over relied on segregated settings. On uh, September 8th, 2015, the DOG, DOJ entered into a proposed settlement with Oregon to resolve these findings um, after a number of years of contested litigation. And the agreement resolved the alleged violations of the ADA and Olmstead. And um, Oregon and the United States Justice Department agreed to serve un to provide relief to an impacted population of approximately 7,000 Oregonians with intellectual and developmental disabilities who can and want to work in typical employment settings in the, in the community. So here were the findings in that case in Oregon. There were 
61% of the people receiving employment and vocational services in Oregon received at least some of their services in workshops. By significant contrast, less than 16% of persons in the service system at any time received individualized to support employment services in competitive integrated employment. And like in Rhode Island, hundreds of youth with intellectual disabilities each year left Oregon schools and entered the front door of Oregon sheltered workshops. And we found that they were not given timely or adequate transition services, the kind of information that would enable them to make informed choices about transitioning to competitive integrated employment after leaving school. The relief in this, in this agreement um, includes support and employment services to 1,115 working age adults and 4,900 youth will receive the kind of transition services necessary to prepare them to obtain real uh, jobs in competitive integrated employment. Um, I, I appreciate the time and I just wanted to point folks to um, the Department of Justice website, which includes our two primary guidances. One, one guidance on um, Title II of the ADA and Olmstead generally, and the second one that came out um, very recently on, um, on Halloween, um, which is our, our guidance as applied to employment service systems. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gina, and uh, I do urge people to, to visit the, the DOJ website, which is full of uh, uh, terrific resources and uh, provides even more in-depth information about the cases that were just shared and uh, other material related to the Olmstead mandate. Um, let me turn next to Annette Shea with the Administration for Community Living, and uh, she will share with us uh, from U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Administration for Community Living, just some of their strategies that are operationalizing the Olmstead mandate. Annette, please take it away. Thank you, Michael, and thank you very much, Gina, for the terrific lead into um, all of the work that's happening at the Administration for Community Living. Just to provide folks with um, a little bit of a, um, just needing to advance the slides, and I want to make sure I'm doing it right. Okay. <laughs> Um, hopefully you're seeing ACL's employment goals. Um, I first want to just give people sort of a, um, a high-level description of what the Administration for Community Living is. It is uh, part of um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. <clears throat> it was, um, I guess, born in um, 2012 when um, Congress decided to merge um, the Office on Disability, the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, and Administration on Aging. It, ACL, the administrator, administrator reports directly to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and um, ACL's Deputy Administrator and the Senior Advisor on Disability Policy also reports um, to the Secretary on disability-related issues. Then in um, 2014, with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, the National Institute on Disability and Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research um, transitioned from RSA to ACL. So ACL continues to get stronger and grow in the area of employment. If, if you have the opportunity, um, if you go on the NIDLERS, that's the acronym, um, if their website, you'll see that they have over 30 research projects right now dedicated to employment promoting employment and testing out different research models in the area of employment. So that's something that really helps strengthen ACL's role when it comes to employment, promoting employment for people with disabilities. And aligning with ACL's strategic plan, ACL come up, came up with a thoughtful vision on what they see as opportunities 
an opportune um, scenario for people with disabilities, and that's individuals with disabilities will not need to choose between health care supports and work to live successfully in the community. Now, we know right now that's not happening, so that's why it's a vision and not a reality, but that's what we strive to have as a reality, and we want to be clear on that. And that aligns well with, the, um, with what Gina was saying in regards to civil rights, employment as a civil right. And then our goal, ACL's goal, is to improve the lives of all individuals with disabilities through pursuing policies that promote improved economic status through employment. And we see a vehicle for that as having folks have access to competitive integrated employment, career skills development, and work supports that they need to achieve and maintain employment. So ACL's priority investments um, include the partnerships and employment, or what we call PI grants. And I've provided a description of the investments we've made in 14 states throughout the years. In 2011, there were some investments made, and those states are listed. Those are coming to a, have come to a conclusion and are wrapping up. We have um, two states that were awarded in 2012 and those will um, stay open and through next year. And then we had a new round of grants just um, announced just a few weeks ago. We also have a training and technical assistance provider, TASH, for the eight grantees, and um, there will be information, I think, on our website soon on that. Um, other ACL investments and priorities include the Employment Communities of Practice, and this is a technical assistance grant, that, and you see the COP grantees um, listed on the bottom. And that's helped to help these communities of practice with the intent of reforming current employment systems with the goal of increased competitive and integrated employment for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Then with the uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, the ACL um, also inherited the um, Centers for Independent Living and with the Fifth Core Service, um, the focus is on transition age youth. So this is, again, some place where we're hoping to strengthen our role. Um, and recently, the Independent Living Administration really finalized its regulations. Those are on our website, ACL's website, if you're interested in looking at that. It goes well beyond um, the employment aspect, but this new fifth core service is, is new for the Centers for Independent Living. Uh, we're also a policy arm for the Medicaid agency uh, with subject matter expertise in the area of, um, of disability policy and the Medicaid buy-in program. Um, and we, our goal is, one of our, our um, strategic objectives is to promote the enhancement of the Medicaid buy-in program across the country. So we're, we're interested in identifying states in which there could be opportunities for policy and programmatic improvement. Um, and so for those who are listening, if, if you have any thoughts or ideas on that, I'd be interested in hearing from you. And my contact information is at the end of this slide deck. We also support CMS in their development of, um, right now there's an informational bulletin that they're working on um, at the, the um, Nashwood, um, HCBS conference a little over a year ago. Um, CMS did present on, on this, and this has been pending now for a while. But there's still opportunities for states when it comes to developing models like this. We just want to make sure folks know that that's out there. And then we also, um, a priority is the WIOA Advisory Committee on increasing competitive integrated employment for individuals with disabilities. That advisory committee recently released their recommendations, and I think that that can be found on, on their website. Um, the settings rule implementation, ACL is partnering with CMS to support the successful implementation of the settings rule. And um, as most may be aware, states are required to comply with the regulation by 2019, March of 2019. Um, on the there's an ACL website. If folks are not familiar with it, I encourage you to visit it. There's actually some links provided at the end of this presentation. Um, we've been featuring some vignettes um, and provider examples from across the country. 
Um, and then also we've just um, released one blog which highlighted tips from each provider. And the focus really is on um, identifying what these providers, providers who successfully converted from sheltered workshops to more integrated mo models, what they identified as key leverage points um, in order for them to achieve their success. And the idea was that with um, all of these transformational changes happening, we were hearing from the field that providers were struggling to figure out how to change their model from the sheltered workshop to more integrated, um, a, a more integrated model because they just felt a little bit like they were stuck in the old model. So they, the idea is for providers and for stakeholders to look at these stories and really see themselves in the example and figure out how they can best make decisions to adopt and encourage similar changes. So then we have our federal partnerships. So we have the Promise Initiative, which folks may be um, familiar with, and there's a description here, and it's a five-year grant um, to five states and a consortium of six states to establish and operate model demonstration projects um, aimed at families um, and children on SSI. Uh, there's the Federal Partners in Transition, uh, which was formed back in 2005. Um, in 2015, FPT released the 2020 Strategic Plan, a federal strategy, which is um, with the goal of improving outcomes for youth with disabilities, transition age youth. And the, um, you'll see that the, uh, the partnerships are similar to the partnerships we have established through the Promise Grants. We also have um, a memorandum of agreement with um, the Office on Disability and Employment Policy. Um, and so we work together to promote um, integrated employment and identify areas where we can strengthen collaboration to really enhance the outcomes in the field. And um, we are actively engaged with that. And we, Chris Button, who you heard from earlier, is um, one of our partners at ODEP. We have, um, you know, um, the ABLE Act, if folks are familiar with the ABLE Act, we see that as a, a positive economic step for people with disabilities. It's not necessarily an employment project, but yet we see that there may be some overlap. Um, and we're coordinating with our federal partners to make sure that um, beneficiaries um, understand what it is. Um, and what it isn't, and also our federal partners, so that um, we can we can best serve our our beneficiaries and our populations. Um, ACL is also strengthening its collaboration with the Department of Education's Rehabilitation Services Administration (RSA), and that is with the goal of improving. Um, employment outcomes for transition age youth. Some of, I've listed some of the historical events and investments just to try and um, put in perspective how we got here. Um, so here I just listed some, some key events that um, maybe folks weren't aware of, one or two of them. Um, but just to see that we really have a very strong foundation to base our policy decisions, and particularly where it comes to employment as a civil right. There's been some major investments made uh, throughout the years and changes. So I've, I've included some resources. Um, one of the things I want to add that is that the, you'll see the ACL blogs featuring employment providers promising practices, and that's the examples that I shared with you earlier. Um, you, for folks that we, I hope you visit our website and I hope that you look at these stories and other blogs too, the way we promote um, employment for people with disabilities, because we also include the opportunity <laughs> to hear from um, from all of you. When you read these stories, if you have questions, if you want to share your experience, it's not, um, it goes to an email box at ACL, 
Um, it doesn't, it's not necessarily like other blogs where you see the comments listed. Um, it's, it's something, so I want folks to know that your input is critical and important, and we, we really appreciate when people provide their insight, provide um, information about their experiences. And there's the list of other, the other um, projects that I mentioned, uh, the Medicaid.gov employment page that people may not be aware of. Um, there's also some deliverables that came from the Medi Medicaid infrastructure grant grants and there's a link to, to that and that's through Mathematica. And here's my contact information. As I said, I'm, one of the things that we're interested in is hearing from the field about um, the provider experience that's happening, also about the state Medicaid buy-in programs. And if you're aware of any success stories, one of the things that we like to do is feature success stories, not just for providers, but for beneficiaries. So if you have some, and um you know, um, an example of a beneficiary who has had success, maybe through the Medicaid buy-in program or through a state system and has achieved um, economic self-sufficiency or improvement, economic improvement and well-being, and it would be, it may be one that we would like to feature on um, our website because it's something that we think is very um, informative and strategic for folks to see that there are people out there that are having positive experiences as part of our um, our collaboration and our work. So thank you. Thank you, Annette. And, and again, that, uh, at the very end of Annette's presentation, uh, a really long list of extraordinary resources <laughs> that I hope people will take advantage of. Let me quickly turn to our third presenter, Allison Wall, Executive Director of APSI. Allison? Great. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to be part of your webinar today. Um, let me go to the beginning of my slide. So I, I, in thinking about this, uh, what I talk about, I'm going to give it a little bit of a um, a provider perspective, not so official um, or an advocacy perspective, and was well, particularly around in, in providers. And I went to, the, to Wikipedia to start, you know, with a defini definition of civil rights because I think we sort of take for granted that we're all talking about the same thing. And the phrases that really grabbed me here was that civil rights ensure one's ability to participate in civil, civil and political life. Of the, of the society and state without discrimination, I'm sorry, the society and state without discrimination or repression. And so I tried to see this through the lens of our systems of public services and support for Americans with disabilities. Earlier in the year, um, in the summer, I sat on a panel um, for the National Association of um, Councils on Developmental Disability with Shelley Reynolds. And, and it, many of you probably know Shelley. She's from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Institute for Human Development. And her discussion topic was on the life, life course framework, which focuses on family support, um, research, and policy for families of individuals with disabilities across the lifespan. And Shelley talked about how it, it's really often our own provider network that can act as a barrier to one's ability to participate in civil and political life. And certainly that was not the intent, um, but that's where we find ourselves in many cases. And for me, um, we have, that really was a huge aha, because it may be obvious to you, but we can't work for civil rights within a framework that often acts as a substitute for community rather than as a facilitator of it. So APSI, um, our mission is to advance employment and self-sufficiency for all people with disabilities in the, um, through advocacy. And the majority of our members are provider organizations. Um, and so we have worked, we work closely with ODAP and particularly the EFS LMP program to provide information and resources to providers so that they can do the very, very complex and frustrating but necessary work of organizational change through systems change. Okay. And so I'm sure many of you have seen this slide. It's, um, you've heard this graphic, you've seen this graphic or heard these numbers. They're actually from a Mathematica study in 2011 um, that broke down federal and state investments for adults with disabilities. 
But this pie chart actually represents $371 billion in federal investments and another $75 billion in state investments, so close to a trillion dollars. And you can see from this that only 1% of those funds go directly to education, employment, and training, while 41% goes to welfare cash payments through SSI and SSDI. So when beneficiaries are dependent on this outdated system, they have no choice but to remain poor in order to receive their benefits. And obviously for a lot of people, these are employment services in, in, in various different service lines. We know that people in, and actually Michael talked about this in the APSI event last week, but we know that people in poverty have fewer choices. And so if individuals with disabilities must depend on SSI to access Medicaid home and community-based services, then they are beholden to a services system that in many cases <clears throat> limits their choices. All right, so I'm going to just advancing this and reading my notes at the same time. Okay. So we go back to the question of, back to Shelley Chandler's point, I'm sorry, Shelley Reynolds' point, which is the service, is our current system part of the problem? And the answer is in many ways yes, in the sense that our service, our system often acts as a barrier to community and a full life. Um, but, you know, initially we were talking about, you know, the work that OVEP has done. Um, and the, the, pro, the work that the EFSLP program has done has made a tremendous amount of progress in pushing pub, the public service system to transform itself and with it, the providers that are funded by it. And they've done this by providing resources, technical assistance, and a model for states to adhere to. So there's, you know, a number of, a number of ways that they've done this. Um, the importance of measurement analysis and knowledge management um, it, it seems sort of dry from a policy perspective, but it, it really can't underscore enough the importance of that. Um, through holistic, individualized supports that sustain employment, so we're not just looking at finding people jobs, but actually then sustaining employment through support. Um, messaging change and solidifying stakeholder buy-in on employment. Um, the, the difficulty in making these organizational changes in, in, in uh, provider organizations can be overwhelming. And it's often our boards and our own families who, are, who present the biggest barriers in moving forward. Um, building strong employer relationship, that seems obvious, but building a sustainable team, and that means building capacity within provider organizations to train and support um, employment support professionals, uh, of which there is a massive shortage of skilled professionals in a critically important but low paying um, you know, job world. Uh, board development and strategy, again, we're seeing these huge generational shifts on boards, and so um, how do we bring our boards of these organizations into, um, you know, to understand that these changes are happening and necessary and timely? And finally, funding, which is really at the core um, of organizational change. How do we um, move funding in, in, a, in a huge system toward away from that 1% um, and in, in the previous slide, into supporting employment in a real and sustainable way versus a system that today keeps people poor in order to receive the benefits. And so it's very difficult for people to focus on civil rights when they're really just getting by. Okay. So I'm going to get, show you two slides, which I um, didn't create, but I use a lot of AFSI. They were created. Um, through the collaboration to promote uh, self-determination by um, Serena Lowe. And Serena was one of the original um, people on the, with the EFS EFS LMP program with Chris Button that really got this program moving. So, the, you know, our current system, and it's shifting, but our current system is really one of cyclical dependency, where we start um, segregated education and, um, you know, often people are placed on the diploma track at very early ages. We know that we have um, weak in school accountability um, for students who take an alternate assessment. We have low expectations. Um, we have a, and we have a lack of long-term support. And it's amazing when you go around the country how few people know about the changes in, with WIOA and, and, and how that trickles down and impacts them. Um, even though it's been in place um, for some time. So focusing on employment, you know, we have a long, we have a system that it's much easier to be placed into extensive segregated options than it is to be 
um, supported in competitive integrated em employment. Um, <clears throat> and that talked earlier about disincentives to work and a hu there's huge focus now around um, the fact that many in, in, with disabilities are paid some minimum wages. And of course, this results in chronic impoverishment, impoverishment, but cyclical dependency, and, and really a loss of human dignity and agency throughout the lifespan. And that also talked a little bit about the ABLE Act um, and you know, the fact that this is, we have asset and income limitations within SSI that haven't been revised since the 80s. So the systems change and by a definition or by extension, organizational change are really looking towards a model of self-sufficiency where starting with education and then going to transition where the idea is to divert uh, individuals from the system of segregated some minimum wage employment by starting the transition process at 14, by exploring post-secondary options, by requiring work experience as part of transition, and um, by being able to braid funding um, for ongoing employment support so that the, uh, the um, employment eligibility is presumed, or eligibility for support is presumed through uh, the VR, one stops and local and state programs. And that the presumed outcome and the goal is in integrated employment in the general workforce. So the mo this model, by contrast, from the, from, from the cyclical dependency model, represents optimal self-sufficiency, independent living, economic empowerment, and full community participation. And, you know, it, it's interesting because this looks a lot more like a civil rights model um, than the original that we talked about, that, that model of, um, of, of chronic impoverishment and cyclical dependency. So I just want to close because um, I know we want to get to some questions. So I, I've been thinking a lot about you know what what comes next after civil rights, and you know as a parent of a young child with Down syndrome, I, I think about a lot about what his future was like, will be like. And the civil rights movement was really started in the 40s and, and before there, before then, you know, informally, and really made its mark in the very tumultuous 1960s. And we're still talking about supporting Americans um, gaining what it, what was rightfully theirs, you know, 50 years later. And so, civil rights are a baseline for what every um, American is entitled to, but doesn't necessarily possess. So I'll close with the thought that we need to think about what comes after civil rights. Um, and systems change is an enormous part of that. And I'd argue that we're entering an era when many groups still have yet um, to achieve, to have their civil rights conferred upon them and now are really seeking their full humanity. So through that lens, we can start to think about how our public services support Americans with disabilities to achieve this in the eyes of the public. And the work that ODEP has done through the systems, through the systems change lens that is driving um, the system change and then by extension organizational change um, has given the system infrastructure and expertise it needs to evolve into the area, into, I'm sorry, into the era beyond civil rights. So that is the end of my uh, program. So please feel free to contact me anytime. Um, we have we have uh, chapters in 38 states and have done uh, extensive work over the last couple of years with ODAP and we appreciate the partnership. So I will turn it back over to the lead center. Thank you, Allison, and, sure. and thank all three of our panelists, Regina, uh, Gina, Annette, and, and Allison. I want to first go to some questions uh, that we have and I'll intersperse some questions that have been coming in the chat box. So uh, let me go to the first question and uh, it's, it's, it's something you all addressed. Um, this civil rights framework requires really better cross-system collaboration, both at a federal and a state level, uh, addressing the needs of people with disabilities and their families, um, greater expectations about employment, uh, integrated uh, uh, employment, uh, livable wages, career pathways. Um, what? What, uh, as, as we uh, near the end of uh, 2016, uh, let me go to uh, Gina first, is um, what's, what's the next generation for you of uh, opportunity to further articulate the civil rights of individuals with disabilities to be in inclusive workforces? 
Well, I think, I uh, appreciate the question. I think that from our perspective at the Department of Justice, you know, we, we are um, we are in the business of enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, um, and there are pockets of excellence in this country where folks are engaged in appropriate integrated individualized services where they are transitioning into competitive integrated employment after school and advance, not only advancing, but, um, you know, uh, ad advancing with um, a job that they prefer and that's the great, a great job match that carries them uh, throughout their career. But in t until, you know, that is a reality for the many um, thousands, if not millions of people in the country with intellectual developmental disabilities and other types of disabilities, including um, mental disabilities and physical disabilities, we've got a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do to enforce the ADA and Olmstead, but also to make sure that folks' um, civil rights are, are protected in other ways, uh, whether it's through employment discrimination once folks are on the job. So it would be hard for me to say that we move past civil rights. I think more it's a question about um, significant civil rights enforcement. Okay. And Annette, um, let me turn to you, and, and you certainly gave many examples of federal state system collaborations, uh, demonstration, technical assistance work of ACL, Administration on Community Living. Um, can you sort of project, what, what's the next generation? I know we're not there, or, or we wouldn't be having all these demonstration projects, but kind of, kind of project out a little bit. What do you see next over the next four years? Well, one thing that um, I will say is, in contrast to what Gina said, we are not an enforcement agency. Uh, we are the policy promoting beneficiary protection focused agency, um, and and so we we would take a different approach in trying to achieve the goals and objectives that I laid out in the beginning of my presentation. Um, what we've tried to do is maintain some consistency in the area of promoting promising practices. We try and stretch sort of our strengths as far as, uh, as far as we can. Now, if we had a crystal ball, we would really like to see the future in five years that Every state would have a Medicaid buy-in program, for example. Right now there's 46 states with Medicaid buy-in programs, and Medicaid buy-in programs, they offer Medicaid supports, sometimes as a wrap around employer-sponsored insurance, to people who need access to long-term services and supports that are not offered through private insurance or through Medicare. So ideally in five years or sooner, that we'll have opportunities for people with disabilities not to suppress their income to try and maintain or, or um, obtain access to the services they need to live successfully in the community. And we, we're going to have to do that in a number of ways, and that's providing meaningful data for people in the states and in the, lo the local level to make the business case to allow for those services to be available and also to make sure that we're not creating a system that disincentivizes employment and, um, and puts people with disabilities in an inequitable situation when it, where it comes to economic well-being. Thank you. Um, Allison, I'm going to shift to a, a different question. And uh, um, as, as, as you said about APSI, uh, with the community that you represent is um, how do we go further in changing thinking and behavior of employment provider staff to embrace a civil rights orientation? And what are the implications for staff training or exposure <laughs> to the rights-based concepts? So I, I, we actually talked a lot about this last week at our regional institute, and a lot of it starts at the state level where states um, need to be thinking about what the future workforce is going to look like. And it doesn't look like the direct, work, direct support workforce today because um, we need to be thinking in terms of um, benefits counseling and job, job, uh, myth, oh, sorry, benefits counseling, um, 
job development, um, discovery, um, job coaching, different sets of skills than we're necessarily training for at, at this point, and, and workforce development. And so those are those are very different sets of skills than we when then are utilized today in a more segregated environment. So states really need to be thinking about what their training looks like and what their workforce development looks like in the next five to ten years. Uh, thank you, thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. let, let me let me go back to Gina and and come back to the ADA. Uh, where in the ADA finding statement, it explains that one of the goals of the ADA, in addition to independent living, uh, is about moving beyond an employment outcome to advancing economic self-sufficiency. How do you see this fitting into the civil rights framework and how might you spell this out as part of the enforcement uh, obligations um, as you interpret Olmstead? Well, let me just say, you know, people who can and want to work and who are currently in segregated, segregated settings simply because they're unable, either unable to access integrated supported employment services to assist them to work, those folks, they're on the sidelines of the economic mainstream. They, you know, some might say they're on the shores, not in the stream of commerce. And so I think, um, you know, when we're, t when we're having this conversation, there's a very clear parallel conversation about economics, uh, <clears throat> the, the conversation that runs alongside civil rights. And our public service dollars don't have the same return on investment that they could, of course, for people who can and want to work um, and who might be relegated to uh, settings unnecessarily. And so, um, you know, those folks are not taxpayers. Uh, they can't access earned income uh, sufficient to allow them to stop receiving public benefits. They're not typically advancing in the workplace like uh, their non-disabled peers. There's very little working your way up in the segregated employment setting, um, no, very little savings. And, and the other piece of this, which we've noticed in our work at the Department of Justice is you know, the, the human element of the eco economics, there's little going out, there's very few people going out to restaurants or to movies or to buying a house or a car, living independently, um, getting married, any of the things that you do that involve financial freedom to do so. And so, you know, it's, it's really important to mention under our work, under our Rhode Island Consent Decree and in Oregon, we've seen people more engaged than they've ever been before um, in their lives uh, now that they have access to increased um, uh, wages and opportunities for advancement. So, you know, we've seen folks that now afford that movie ticket or that concert ticket, um, they're going to, to, to that baseball game uh, that they, they didn't do before. And people's expectations have changed over time. Um, you know, I'm thinking of one gentleman who works at a health center um, and earning competitive wages for the past two years. And his goal is now, his goal has now become to save up enough money um, to live independently. And I, and I suspect that that was not his goal before, um, you know, when he was participating in an in-school shelter workshop and earning, you know, between 50 cents and $2 an hour. So I think, I think this is about aiming high, and aiming high is certainly, and always has been, always will be a core feature um, of an economy that works for people and of opportunity and self-sufficiency. And we've we've known, we've taken significant note that aiming high rarely happens in an environment where wages are stagnant, where there's lack of opportunities for advancement, but also where folks are not presented with information to make meaningful or informed choices about a different, uh, different service options and different ways that employment can happen. Thank you. Um, let me uh, uh, pull in one of the questions from the chat box. Um, uh, I think each of you has, has talked about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but we had a comment uh, wanting to know is, uh, and maybe I'll stay with you, Gina, is, is the same Olmstead mandate impact people uh, with other types of disabilities, or is it only for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? That's a really great question. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. 
That, that's a really great question. And um, no, the, the answer is that Olmstead and the ADA have a broad mandate and, um, and it is not a ruling that has singular, you know, application to folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In fact, you know, um, October 31st of this year, we issued guidance related to um, Title II of the ADA Olmstead and employment. And on the first page, we know, you know, that, that, that the civil rights of persons with disabilities, including, you know, individuals with mental illness, intellectual or developmental disabilities, or physical disabilities, um, or other disabilities might be impacted. There is quite a broad reach of Title II of the ADA and Olmstead. It just so happens that the cases that we ran through today involve folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But uh, check out the guidance and, and um, there's some commentary in there that's useful on the uh, broad reach of the ADA and Olmstead. Thank you. And maybe this question for Annette, another one from the chat box is what tools and resources are available for a workshop to become more integrated and competitive and be able to pay minimum wage or, or above while still providing um, services and opportunities in a segregated environment? That's, a, that's also a very good question. The, uh, so the blogs that I referred to were provider examples and vignettes of what those providers, which would be peers of others, who are operating sheltered workshops to try and make the change and the transformation. There are existing resources in the form of technical guidance with regard to what types of things Medicaid pays for, where funds from uh, VR come into play, and, and those resources can be found, say, if, if a provider is wondering whether or not, you know, if Medicaid pays for certain services and supports. One of the things that these examples provided for the reader um, is how to sequence funding from different sources, like Medicaid, like VR, sometimes like um, the Ticket to Work um, Employment Network resources, but um, so there are different ways to go about making those changes, um, but and, you know, there are some incremental steps that are, that need to be taken before you can, you can just completely convert your model and, and if, if you're an established provider with a large pool of people who are working in a sheltered environment, it's going to take some time. We understand that and I think that we have more and more now providers coming forward saying help us convert our business model and we're able to provide them with some resources through technical assistance sites, through even um, the ODEP site. Um, ODEP certainly has a rich set of resources for states and for providers um, as well as Medicaid and, um, and other tools. We can direct people to different links and information if they like. But there are definitely opportunities for technical assistance with regards to that. Thank, thank you, Annette. And this question also from the chat box, I think I'll direct it to Allison. Uh, a person uh, writes, as someone who works with parents, uh, it's often challenging when the family wants to hold their son and daughter, son or daughter back, uh, doesn't believe that their son or daughter is capable of work and being able to work in integrated environments. Um, what uh, they're particularly asking, are there projects you might cite to? Uh, I can ask you that and may turn that over to Gina and, and Annette uh, uh, in a moment, but um, I'm sure APSI has many examples of uh, that type of situation. What, as a parent, what, what might you say to this provider? Well, I, and I know from so many of our members that um, those that are trying to provide more employment options um, and different types of employment services, that, that, it, that it's often the case that it's families that are fearful and um, are often the people that really don't don't want they want to keep um, their loved one in a you know an environment that they are that's considered safe. So, uh, you know, a couple of things. Um, I, it, I, was at a panel that um, ACL and DOJ actually put together in the, for the 15th anniversary of Olmstead, and they had they brought in people who were part of the Rhode Island consent decree, and they really didn't want 
um, they really didn't want their older children. And in this case, in these cases, they were people in their 20s, you know, to go into another option, but they were forced to. And often, what happens is once their loved one tries it, and they see the difference. They're much more open to it. So I would say talk to other parents and other providers who have gone through similar experiences. Um, and um, commu for providers, communicate with your family is a lot. Sometimes what happens is providers will just say, "Okay, so for, after this date, we're going to do this," and it's it, you know they're not getting the buy-in from the families. But it's a you know the providers need to make sure that they are. Um, including the families in the decision-making process and also giving them the opportunity to try. And I think sometimes we don't give people with disabilities the opportunity to fail. We're so, we're so invested in um, a certain model that we, we're afraid that that person is going to fail. Um, but I would say, so I would say reach out to other groups or to other providers who've gone through this transition or are going through the transition and other families have been through this because um, often when they see the, the impact that it's had on their uh, their loved one, um, they see that there's a huge that there's an enormous difference um, in, in in independence, in skills, in attitude, and most importantly, talk to the people themselves who have been through it. We at our all of our our conferences at our regional institute, we always put self-advocate panels together so you can hear exactly from them what their experience is because obviously there is nothing more important than the lived experience of people with disabilities who have been through these changes. Thanks. And uh, let sure. me turn to, to Annette. You may want to also have an answer to that last question, but I'll also throw an additional one to you, which is what needs to be done to better align federal and state disability employment policies with human and civil rights imperatives? Well, with regard to the last question, one of the things that, that we've found is what helps families, because oftentimes it's the beneficiary who wants to be empowered and wants to make their own decision and their choices about me having meaningful day activities and work and employment. Um, but we also have, you know, it's the fear from the family that um, it has, we waited too long to even suggest or raise the idea of employment. Um, if you've waited till they're well into their 20s, you've basically set yourself up to, for a long journey. But, you know, you have to start talking about it while the child is still in school and introduce the idea that they really have opportunities in the community to work just like anyone else. Um, and once they, they sort of start to get used to the idea and they get, get more information, I think their comfort level also goes up. So to your question about how state and federal policies better align, um, it, it, it starts, it has to start with communication and engagement um, at the local level, at the state level, and, and really providing data to support and make business cases to have policies that are friendly to promoting employment. Uh, one of the things that is a, a misconception is that when you are, say, the Medicaid buy-in program, for example, it's, um, an ex it's just purely an expansion of Medicaid. Well, while it may look like that from the authority's point of view, the, the, the Medicaid authority, um, it's also helping people sort of graduate from other Medicaid programs. So it, it ends up not being an extra cost to the Medicaid program oftentimes because it's folks who either were already eligible for the Medicaid program or could be if they impoverish themselves because it's, it's a program for people with disabilities. So it's, it's just making sure you keep the dialogue going and you have the information you need to have those discussions to make sure when new folks come on, you know, with transition, we're about to face another transition. It's just a natural part of life that you have, you're going to have new state folks, local folks, um, all kinds of decision makers that will come and go. And so you need to have the tools and the information ready to have those discussions and keep yourself informed about what's happening at the federal level to the degree possible. Okay, thank you. Um, let me go to uh, another question, and 
this is uh, about, um, well, there, I'll, I'll combine several that uh, take some uh, information from the chat box. Uh, one question was uh, about that uh, there are not enough uh, trained individuals doing benefits planning and analysis. Um, what can be done about that? I'll combine that with um, is uh, the availability of uh, that type of subject matter expertise. I'll go back to Gina. Uh, would that be part of what, in fact, uh, uh, would be a requirement to meet the, the Olmstead community integration mandate? Well, we um, appreciate the question. We, we've, we've certainly included this in um, some relief that we've agreed to with, uh, with the state of Rhode Island, for instance. Um, and the reason being is because we recognize this to be the single, perhaps the single largest impediment in folks' anxieties and fears about entering uh, competitive employment. Um, with the least amount of information, uh, the least amount of available information that we've seen uh, in terms of the specific impact of a specific income on public benefits. And so folks are um, twisting in the wind trying to make a decision about a huge life transition quite often, quite frequently, without specific advice about what the impact of earned income is on public benefits. And so it, it's, it's one kind of uh, relief, and it, we have included that folks will, will receive a, a benefits plan. But that certainly isn't the answer nationally, uh, where we find that there are far too many people who um, are having trouble finding counselors that have the right type of training and accreditation in order to provide the type of services necessary to advise and counsel families in this way, counsel, uh, counsel future, future employees in this way. And so uh, that's certainly something um, that begs uh, our attention at the federal level in terms of uh, at the agency level, um, the, the lack of resources related to benefits planning and how it corresponds almost directly um, to the decision making and the ability to make informed choices about whether to transition from segregated work into competitive work. Thank you. Um, let me go to uh, yet uh, another question which uh, uh, has come in, and, and, and that is, um, are there uh, any plans currently in place or in development that speak to the need for, for certifying employment support professionals? And I think I'll turn that one over to um, Allison, who probably has a, a, an answer to that. <laughs> sure, so I wanna make sure, I wanna make sure I understood, that I heard the question, so about, it was about has there ever been an op the option of certifying employment professionals? Yeah, does such a certification exist or, or the person no. is really asking, we really need something like that to ensure better quality in the yeah. service delivery across the country? Michael, thank you for the softball question. I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, sure, so APSI has um, the only uh, program which uh, it certifies employment professionals called the Certified Employment Support Professional Program or CESP certification. And um, we've had about 2,000 people certified um, since the program's inception just a few years ago. And we, what's happening now is states are starting to use the CESP as is exactly what you talked about, quality, a quality control measure. Um, because in order to be eligible to sit for the exam, you have to have at least a year of experience um, in, the, in the profession. So it's, re there's, it's really an aptitude test. And um, so, so in some places, states um, fund the test. In other places, providers pay for them, but we, we are happy to set up these those exams in any state. Um, we will get the proctors. There is no ch there is no charge um, to hold the exam or host the exam, and we'll get you all the materials. So we'd be happy to. We would love to expand the program. We're having we're having a hard time keeping up with it right now because it's really really um, expanding very rapidly. Okay. Next question. Question number six is um, from our original set of questions. And this one I think I, I, I will ask each of you because uh, I think each of you has a different perspective. 
What more can people with disabilities do to self-advocate for employment as a fundamental civil right? What more do they need to know? And what support might they need? And let me, let me start with Annette. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, well, one of the things, I think we're in this, right now, where we are is in a much better place than, say, where we were 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and part of that is people have more access to information than they ever had before. So that is something that helps people become stronger self-advocates. We're also really trying to encourage youth to become involved in public policy, um, even beyond their own individual um, rights, but to think about it uh, as we try to sort of grow our advocacy base. That's sort of our one of our perspectives. Um, and the um, so ACL recently just launched, and I'm trying to find it, a self-advocacy or an advocacy um, project, and I can actually send that to you too. But I, I would encourage people to visit our website to try and learn more about some of the things that are going on. But that that's something we definitely um, take very seriously. Um, beneficiaries is really why we're here, um, and so. Um, that's, I guess, the best answer I'm going to give. Leave time for the others. And um, Gina, uh, your thoughts on this question? On self-advocacy, I, I saw the question and I thought it was an important one because, um, you know, we've found that people with disabilities are quite clearly the most effective advocates and mentors when it comes to introducing their peers, uh, introducing other people with disabilities to the benefits of working in competitive integrated employment. And, you know, in fact, um, we've included peer-to-peer -peer mentoring um, as relief in the settlement agreements that I mentioned today. But, um, you know, there's nothing more powerful than somebody who was in a workshop, uh, somebody who did perform piecework and at sub-minimum wages and, and maybe for a really long time, um, getting uh, a newfound perspective in competitive employment and coming back to introduce their, their friends and their peers to the benefits of what that job has done in their life and done for them, how their lives, you know, the communication of how lives have changed and what is possible is very powerful and far more powerful than any kind of um, guidance document or, or information um, in, in, that, that the government might, government might supply in some other format. And so we, we recognize that and we hope that uh, folks out there are leveraging the power of that message of, of folks um, honestly communicating um, what it means to have a job and, and, and what the contrasts are to, to what it means to um, um, to participate in, in segregated employment, perhaps if if if, if you if you if you don't want to, um, so uh, you know those those um, that have engaged in that type of public speaking and those types of presentations have really been powerful and effective advocates for um, uh, for competitive integrated employment. I, I'm thinking of. Um, you know, a, a guy who received relief in one of our agreements and he, he said that, um, you know, there was a time when he thought that bench work was all he had going for himself. And this is the same guy who is now, you know, a self-advocate who's out there speaking about the benefits of competitive integrated employment and transfer, transportation, uh, advocating for uh, increased support for transportation for folks to get to their jobs. Um, and, and he went from doing that bench work thinking that that was, um, that was what, what he could accomplish and um, all he had going in his work. And, and now he works five days a week um, as an assistant chef at a daycare with competitive wages. And when I think about the life transformation and the potency of that message, I think that the, the, that is so important um, that we take advantage of um, listening and uh, public forums in which folks that have made these successful transitions can reach back uh, and provide uh, advice and wisdom and mentorship to other folks that are considering making similar transitions.
Thank and you. Michael, Thanks. can I just throw this? Sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Michael, can I just quickly add that the, the it, the ACL project I was referring to is the first ever National Resource Center for Self-Advocacy to empower people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So information on that is, is on the ACL website. Thank you. And Allison, did, did you want to add a comment on this question? Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Gary, I, I, I uh, haven't forgotten about you. Um, uh, you're still there. Uh, I am still here. It's going well. Uh, Comment, or, or do you, would you like to uh, put a question to the panel? Well, I'll, I'll add one comment. Early on, I, I mentioned that ODEP and, and Lee will be issuing an issues brief on provider transformation, and I note that a number of the questions were, well, how do we do this thing, and, and how do we address some of the major issues? So in that issues brief, uh, there is a section with examples from the field on um, shifting attitudes and addressing fears and influencing state funding to prioritize competitive integrated employment. And then some thoughts about capacity building within programs and then building partnerships. So that's going to come out and that hopefully will provide some uh, guidance to folks. But um, I do, I would like to pose one, one question to sort of and where we began this session here on this election day. And, and I guess I'll just leave it open to anybody that would, would like to answer this. So what do we know about improved citizen participation when people with disabilities are working? And do we have examples of that in your experience? And, or, or is this a gap that we really need to fill in our knowledge? So who would like to answer that question on this? election day. This is, this is Annette. I hate to ask such a question, but can you repeat the question part of that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's about citizen participation. So exercising their right to vote, to run for elective office, for doing all the things that we you know, um, enjoy as citizens. Do we have any? Do we have any evidence that when people move into competitive integrated employment, that they actually increase their role in a citizen capacity in the United States? Well, at, so I can speak from ACL's perspective. Other than any kind of focus project, we wouldn't have any measurement tools to assess that. Um, but we would hope that through different surveys and quality measurements that are happening in the field, that states will start to collect more information that's related to quality of life outcomes and the impact of employment in a more systemic way. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Gina, do you have an idea on this one? I, I think I'm gonna um, I'm, go I'm gonna I'm gonna take a pass. Uh, because I don't have a, I don't have a data point, um, and so I, I don't want to um, suppose the answer. Okay, and to Allison, um, anything that we know from the field and from the experience of your EPSI members? Say we don't. I mean, we don't have any data. I have certainly certainly anecdotal information, um, mm -hmm. but no data compiled. I mean, once someone is um, making decisions for him or herself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having, whether that's through, you know, supportive decision making um, or, you know, just being, interacting with um, with the community at large, they're mm -hmm. obviously going to have more civic engagement and be more a part of their community versus someone who has a lot of things done for him or her or is used to not having personal agency and making decisions for him or herself. So, Excellent. yeah. Okay. Well, then, Michael, I think that, this um, probably represents maybe one of the next frontiers in, in knowledge development and how does employment improve um, civic um, as well as social and economic participation. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to turn it back to you, Michael, and um, we'll get the session ended. Thank you, Gary, and, and thank uh, all our panelists today for not only your presentations, but your uh, uh, very candid and full answers to the questions, both uh, pre-prepared and those that came in.
from the many hundreds of participants across the country. Um, we do urge you to connect with the LEAD Center, which is uh, a center funded by ODEP uh, with extraordinary resources on our website, leadcenter.org, both uh, about employment first, customized employment, building financial capability, cross-system collaboration, uh, and uh, effective and meaningful participation of people with disabilities in the workforce development system. Um, the slide on the screen uh, shares with you how to connect with us uh, through social media as well, as well as some of the uh, lead center staff. So again, um, uh, wonderful presentations and perspectives shared. Uh, we appreciate your interest, and uh, uh, you, uh, at this point, I think we are out of time. So thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to you visiting with us and participating in future LEAD Center webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.